part in that song where it says, um, there'll be no more sorrow someday when tomorrow heaven is our home, right? It's a great image, great picture of the future, a great outlook and perspective on what we all get to enjoy and experience in Jesus and in our relationship with God. Um, gives us great security, knowing that um, no matter what happens to us, God is faithful, right? God is going to take care of us. And as much as it hurts to um, lose loved ones, you know, like Mark, some of the others that have passed away this past year, uh, J. Brian Craig, um, we have God, and we have a great future in store. We have something to look forward to, a great hope and a great salvation in Jesus. Amen? Amen. I do want to talk a little bit about the future this morning. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. We have a, um, a new administration coming in in January, and normally around these times, we begin to think about the future. What is the future going to be like under this new administration? What is uh, going to happen in the future? I was in the post office this past week. I don't know why, but our post office is kind of like the barber shop. Because you go in the post office and everybody's in there. I mean, like very few people are actually going through the line and getting postal stuff done. People are there and they're just talking about the latest issues and talking about politics and gossiping and everything else. And I'm just kind of standing in line like, come on, guys. Like, I got a package to deliver. But um, in, in, in some of this back and forth, they were... They were talking about the future, and they were talking about, well, you know, well, I'm not even going to say what was said, because if I do, I will alienate exactly one half of us. <laughs> it doesn't matter what side you're on. But I think the point is that we, 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 we always are trying to look into the future to, to see, to know, to understand what is our life going to look like? What are the lives of the people around us going to look like? Will we have security? Will we have protection? Will we be okay going into the future? And I think that that is kind of the backdrop for Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, reversing back to Daniel chapter 7, uh, that vision was from the first year of Belshazzar. In Daniel chapter 8, that was from the third year of Belshazzar. Today's passage is, is different. It's the first year of, of Darius. And these visions that Daniel is getting is, is, are coming in once every other year or so. So it kind of communicates the magnitude of each one of these visions. It's not like he's having one every night when he goes to bed. Like once every other year or so, something like amazing God is revealing to Daniel. And we're going to read about what was revealed to him as well in Daniel chapter 9. But to know the future, I think one of the things that we get is you got to read the Bible in order to know the future. Uh, Nostradamus was, was very uh, popular back in the 80s, uh, apparently making lots of different prophecies about uh, world wars and that kind of thing, and, and, and some of them very, very, very loosely, you know, could be matched to what he said. And people began to put stock in what he said to try to figure out the future. We're going to see Daniel, when he's thinking about the future, he goes to the scripture. And God opens up the future to him. And I believe God opens up the future to us as well. And it's a very, very good future. The title of the lesson this morning is God's Promises Stand. God's Promises Stand. Let's pray briefly before we get into the word this morning. Father, uh, you are a God that is a revealer of mysteries. You're a God that knows the future just like you know the past. Father, you know all things. Not only do you know all things, God, but you reveal things to man. And for those things that you've revealed to us, Father, we're very grateful we're thankful for revealing your truth to us. We're grateful for revealing yourself to us in Jesus. 
We're grateful for the prophecies and the scriptures that tell us about the future and what is to come. And we pray that we'd be able to find great peace and comfort in those scriptures, knowing that we've been covered by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. There is no harm that will come to us in the future because of Jesus, nothing that we should be terrified about, nothing that we should fear, because we rest securely in you. We thank you, Father. We pray for the family of Lauren Cagle and Mark's family as well, who are um, suffering through hardship and pain right now. We pray that you would bring them great comfort. I pray that you would help them to stand and to stand firm not just with you, but also with each other, and help us to be there for them as a church as well. We thank you, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Three points this morning. The first is simply the promise of scripture. The promise of scripture. Who was this Darius, son of Xerxes? If you read in the ESV, uh, he's called uh, uh, Ahasuerus, 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 I think that's how you say his name. And there would have been about, again, about a couple of years between uh, this particular instance in uh, Daniel chapter 9 and the previous one in Daniel chapter 8. Again, by this time in Daniel's life, he's now in his late 80s, 85, 86, 87, somewhere in there. He's still searching the scriptures for truth. We are never too old, church. We've never learned enough. We never figure it out, and we have never arrived. Daniel understood that. And so we find Daniel looking into the Word of God, looking for answers. Things have changed in his country just like things are changing in our country. He was used to different kings changing, but now there's a completely new nation that has taken over Babylon. God put a stop to, the, to Belshazzar and his drunken orgy with the writing of the, on the wall, and God put a stop to Babylon altogether. Babylon, the great kingdom, has fallen now into the hands of the Medes and the Persians, with Darius now in control. And I'm speculating, but Daniel is probably wondering, how will this change affect the exiles? Will this change of government mean liberation for God's people? Yes or no? And he goes to God with this question, instead of going to men... And he asks, God, what is your plan? He doesn't go to Darius and say, Darius, what are you going to do in the future? He goes to the scriptures. He goes to the word of God to see what he can find out. And what did Jeremiah read? He didn't have the Bible as we have it today, right? He didn't even have all of the Old Testament because actually the Old Testament was still being written. The Old Testament was still being written through him, right? The book of Daniel is part of the Old Testament and it wasn't done yet. And so he didn't have the whole Bible, but he had books. And in those books were recorded the words of prophets from the past. And among them was a lonely prophet named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's life overlapped with Daniel's life for about 50 years or so. Jeremiah started preaching about 8 to 10 years before Daniel was born. And so surely Daniel, as he was still in Jerusalem before the exile, he would have at least heard of Jeremiah. If not, maybe, maybe, again, speculating, maybe he actually heard Jeremiah preach. I don't know. But Jeremiah was known for preaching doom and destruction, and Jeremiah had a lot of grief because of it. And when the other prophets said, peace, peace, Jeremiah said, there is no peace. He said, there's war and there's judgment instead on the horizon in the future. When they said security, Jeremiah said exile. 
And so Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet for that reason. Jeremiah was not a popular preacher. After his sermons, the people did not have warm fuzzies. They hated Jeremiah. They hated him. And that's why he was so lonely. And so Daniel is searching the prophets for what's going to happen, and he comes across Jeremiah chapter 25. I'm not going to read all of it, but in verse 1 it says, The word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Verse 8, therefore the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and of everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country, referring to Israel, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. And so in this verse, in this section, we hear, or I'm sorry, the beginning of Daniel chapter 9, he says that he understood from the scriptures. And now this is roughly uh, 60, 60 years later, about 30 years after Jeremiah died, Daniel reads Jeremiah's writings and he calls them scripture. You know, it's, it's harder to, what's the Bible say? Jesus said that um, a prophet has no honor in his own hometown, right? And, and when people are familiar to you, it's a little bit harder to listen to them, right? And to believe them. Now, Daniel and Jeremiah, again, they weren't incredibly close. They weren't buddies or anything like that. But they were contemporaries. And I would imagine that it would be kind of challenging to believe this uh, contemporary preacher who is preaching all of this doom and gloom as he's preaching these things. But later on, as Daniel looks back on Jeremiah's prophecies, he calls it scripture. And he places full faith, full belief in what Jeremiah has to say. And Daniel has a very strong response to what Jeremiah has to say. And it's because the 70 years were coming up soon. He makes a calculation. Wait a minute. How long have we been here? How long have I been here? Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. That's coming up. In Jeremiah 29.10, I'm sure he read this as well. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon... I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Referring to Israel, going back to Israel. Israel going back to Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you. This is everybody's favorite verse in the Bible, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Could you imagine Jeremiah reading this prophecy and realizing the 70 years are almost up? I see what God is going to do in the future. And so when Daniel reads this, that there's a plan for Israel to return after these 70 years, and that that plan involves Israel praying and seeking God, guess what Daniel does? He gets fired up. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start praying and seeking God because the 70 years are almost up, and I want to go home. He doesn't get to go home, unfortunately. But that's what he's thinking. I believe. I'm speculating. 
Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel puts effort into praying to God. He didn't just pray, but he petitioned. He asked God. He changed his clothes just to go and pray. He went without food. He covered himself with ashes, which symbolized ruin and destruction. He was serious. And Daniel wanted to humble himself before God because of this prophecy that he had read. He was moved by the promise of Scripture. And he believed what God said. And you could tell it by how Daniel was living. I pray that we are stirred in this way by the promise of Scripture as well. I pray that we are moved from the inside out. I pray that we also believe what God promises. And not only do we believe, but we actually live on those promises, that our lives change because of God's promises, that we can rearrange our lives around the things that God says because we trust in him so much. Amen? Point number two. Prayer and petition, verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We've not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. Yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Are you catching the theme here? Verse 16, Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. What an amazing prayer. There are some things that we can learn from this amazing prayer that Daniel prays. One, he's praising God throughout the prayer. Did you notice that? He keeps coming back to God's mercy, keeps coming back to God's forgiveness, keeps coming back to God's righteousness. 
And praying against a backdrop of praise helps us to believe what we're actually praying. Try it next time that you pray. Try spending five minutes just praising God for who he is before asking him for something and see how it changes your perspective. The second thing that we find is Daniel takes responsibility. He includes himself in Israel's sin. He didn't say the sin of our forefathers, the sin of our ancestors. He didn't say their sin. He didn't say the sin of generations past. He said we. He said our. He said us. He confesses Israel's collective sin. And he confesses them directly and pointedly. There were no qualifications. There were no caveats. There were no conditions, just their sin. And he spoke of it like it was fresh, like it was real, like it was happening right then and there. Remember, Israel had gotten exiled 70 years ago. But he's speaking and preaching and confessing and praying as if it had just happened today. And so Daniel says sorry before he says please. He doesn't come in with a shopping list of everything that he wants to get from God. Gimme, 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 gimme. He comes in with humility and humiliation, saying sorry first. Sorry for what? What were their sins specifically? At least three times he does generally say, we have sinned against you, but he doesn't stop there. He names specific sins. Verse 5, we have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. Verse 6, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Verse 7, because of our unfaithfulness to you. Verse 9, we have rebelled against him. Verse 10, we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us. Verse 13, we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. What were their sins? Wickedness, rebellion, not listening, unfaithfulness, disobedience, law-breaking, and a lack of repentance, not turning to God. Now I'll ask, which of these sins did Daniel personally commit? Which of these sins did Daniel personally commit? Now, he does have sin. He's a human being. Verse 20, Daniel says that he confessed his own sin. He was human. But he probably wasn't personally guilty of these particular sins. Daniel was a fairly righteous man. And so it makes me ask the question, is there such a thing as collective sin? Sin that we or that a people can commit as a group? I think the answer is yes. Read uh, 1 Corinthians, right? It's all about a church that's in sin. And chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, Paul goes and he's basically calling out the entire church for their sin. Look at the seven churches in Revelation, chapter 2, chapter 3. They're all about Jesus calling out sin, collective sin, in those churches, And of course, Israel as a people and as a nation had sin, and Daniel confessed those sins as his own. Confessing sin is humbling, yet it's very powerful. It helps us to see who we really are before God. It takes off the blinders. It takes off the the, the grandiose thoughts and, and, and feelings of us being better than we actually are. It puts us in our place. Confession means to say the same, to say the same as God, meaning he knows who we are already, but yet we act and behave as if we're something other than that. And when we confess, we say the same as God. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. If it's good to consider sin in our personal lives and confess it, 
Is it good for us to consider and confess our collective sin as a church? Are we one body or not? We are one body. In church, we do have collective sin. I'm not saying you're in sin. I'm not saying we're in sin right now. I'm saying that we have collective sin that we should consider and that we should take time to confess. As I thought and prayed about it, I think that it seems like we have sinned in ways of either being too strong or too weak. Because I have my own list of what I think and believe our sins are, and I've confessed to God, very heartbroken, about those sins and how I've participated in them. But as I kind of cataloged and inventoried those sins, they really did fall into, well, these are a result of us being too strong, and these are a result of us being too weak. I'm not going to share what those sins are that I perceive that we have because I want to encourage and maybe even challenge all of us to think communally, think communally, and go back and pray on your own. Ask yourself what you think our collective sin or sins may be. And maybe as a good starting point, you can ask, how as a church have we been too strong? How as a church have we been too weak? And maybe some of your answers will bring up some of those sins that are there. Church, let's say the same as God and confess our corporate sin in the same way that we do our personal sin. Because the benefits and the results are the same. Amen? third amazing thing about this prayer is as Daniel takes responsibility, he holds God blameless. He holds God blameless. Verse 7, again, Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. Verse 9, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. Verse 14, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. There's no blaming. There's no blame shifting. There's no complaining. There's no whining. No, but God, if only you had done, then we wouldn't be. There's no Lord, but we had no choice but to. None of that. God is blameless. God is just. And the suffering that they had been experiencing for the last 70 years was holy and righteous judgment. And God was not being mean or cruel in executing that judgment. He was following through on what the prophets had warned Israel against for decades. Decades. It reminded me that after Job, after Job was afflicted in Job chapter 2, uh, verse 9, it says, His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. And as you read the book of Job, you, you, he, he's constantly teetering you know, between Oh, God, like this is your fault. And it seems like he just wants to unleash on God throughout the entire book. And I believe it. sometimes he does kind of let it fly. But Job, in this instance, didn't blame God, and we cannot either. Life is hard. Life is tough. We do suffer. There are challenges. But it's not because God is bad. It's not because God is wrong. It's not because God has made a mistake. It's a result of this fallen world that we live in. That's why we suffer. 
Everything God does is right. And so we have to hold him blameless. Amen. The fourth thing that we learn about Daniel's prayer is his petitions are based on God's goodness. And these are great lessons of prayer for all of us. His petitions were based on God's goodness. Verse 18, give ear our God and hear, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen, Lord, forgive, Lord, hear and act. When we confess our sins, we see ourselves for who we really are. We realize that we bring nothing to the table. We have no bargaining chip. We have no stack of cash to use as leverage in our relationship with God to get him to do or not do one thing or another. Nothing to fall back on, nothing to lean on. That's where Daniel was after he had confessed Israel's sin. And since he didn't have anything to bring to the table, he didn't bring anything to the table. He petitioned God based on God because there was nothing else for him to petition based upon. He was reminding God of who he is and asking him to return them to their homeland based on that, who God is. Lord, do this because of your great name, not because of my great name, our great name. Lord, you're going to be looking bad. Protect your reputation, not protect our reputation. Do this, Father, because you are merciful. Daniel brought their sin out into the light and basically said, Lord, if we're going to be rescued, it's going to be because of you and your mercy, not because of us and our righteousness, because we're a mess. It will be because of how good you are and not how good we are or how good we think we are. Third point, the response from heaven. What? I'm okay on time. Well, maybe I'll run a little bit over. <laughs> That's all right. We still got a little. I mean, it's a long chapter, a lot to unpack. <laughs> We're all right. Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. What an amazing picture of the realities in the spiritual world. What a response from God. As Daniel prays and confesses his sin and Israel's collective sin, he petitions the Lord and God's heavenly messenger, Gabriel, the one who stands in the very presence of God, comes swiftly to Daniel's side to give him insight and understanding. And he does it about the time of the evening sacrifice. What evening sacrifice? He's in Babylon. The temple is gone. Temple has been gone for decades. There hadn't been an evening sacrifice in almost 70 years. And so this mention, plus the reference in Daniel chapter 6 of him praying three times daily, you remember that before he got put into the lion's den, makes me think that Daniel was doing everything that he could to continue living as a Jew even while he was in exile. And so you can take Daniel out of the promised land, but you can't take the promised land out of Daniel. <laughs> he held on to his God even when he was an alien. And verse 23 says, as soon as you began to pray, like as soon as you got on your knees, as soon as you said, oh, Father, things started moving and happening. An angel was dispatched to Daniel's side. 
Remember Jeremiah 29, 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. God is saying, as soon as you called out to me, I heard you. As soon as you opened your mouth, God is listening to us. God hears us. In those small mumbles of prayers early in the morning, late at night, on your job. Oh, God, please help me in this interview right now. Lord, help me as I go into this store. Help me to share my faith. Whatever it is, God hears that. And whether they're short, whether they're long, whether they're well-ordered and structured, whether they're random and all over the place, God hears. God can figure that out. He can figure out your random prayers. And he dispatches his angels in response. We don't necessarily see it. Don't necessarily feel it all the time. But the heavens are moved when we pray. The heavens are moved. Verse 23. Gabriel says, Therefore consider the word and understand the vision. Now Daniel already had miraculous ability to understand visions and dreams, but I think he's going to need a little bit of extra help with this one. This is one of the most debated passages in the Old Testament. This passage has been called the dismal swamp of Old Testament study. Because many have gotten wrapped up, caught up, and trapped in the quicksand of these upcoming verses. Even the most spiritual, most educated scholars disagree. But what they do agree on is that this text is incredibly difficult. And the interpretation of this vision is not central to our lives or our doctrine. And that's why I've spent more time on the first 22 verses instead of these last five or six. All I can do at this point is give my perspective of it today because it very well may change tomorrow (laughs) or next week or next month as God teaches me, okay? Take it and weigh it against your own prayer in Bible study. Verse 24. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem... Until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. I I don't know. (laughs) Let me just say, (laughs) I don't know. Are the sevens weeks? Are the sevens years? In other parts of the Bible, sevens were referred to as weeks. Scholars say in this instance, it's years because weeks doesn't make any sense. Should the years or weeks or the sevens be understood literally or symbolically? And unfortunately, the NIV translation does not help. Is the anointed one of verse 25 and 26 the same person as the ruler who sets up an abomination that causes desolation in verse 27? Read the ESV. I'm not going to go through the ESV uh, translation of it, but it does make it a little, has some distinction between those two people. 
Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is confusing. Sorry. <laughs> there is a decree, however, that Cyrus puts out that the captives will return to their native lands. And that's what he's referring to in verse 25. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So that we can know, right? I mean, let's get the clear stuff out of the way, right? He talks about these seven sevens and 62 sevens. That totals up to 69 sevens, right? And Cyrus decrees that the captives can return to their lands. And I'm not going to try to do the math, but... Supposedly, from the time that that decree was made until the time Jesus died, that equals all of the different sevens that are in there. It sounds good to me. I'm willing to trust it. But a basic principle of biblical interpretation is to let what is clear shed light on what is unclear. We don't want to let the unclear passages change what we know and believe about the already clear passages. Amen? And so again, verse 24, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. I don't know about you, but that sounds like Jesus to me. Sounds like Jesus to me, plain and clear, because these things happen with Jesus. Jesus finishes transgression. Jesus puts an end to sin. Jesus atones for wickedness. Jesus brings in everlasting righteousness, right? But the question still remains, was this prophecy fulfilled 2,000 years ago with Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension? Or are these things still yet to come in the future? Or is it both? Personally, I think it's both. I think that, yes, it was fulfilled with Jesus' coming, but it still projects and foreshadows what is to come. We refer to the idea of already but not yet, which refers to the idea that some aspects of the kingdom of God are already present, but others are not yet. Jesus has died. He has risen. He has ascended, but he has not yet returned. We have begun eternal life in Jesus by having our sins forgiven, but yet we have not fully experienced eternity yet. And so at the end of the day, like I said, I'm not going to break this down any more than that, okay? That's it. Go back, study it on your own. At the end of the day, Daniel was searching for answers about the future of his people, and God, through Gabriel, gave Daniel a vision about Jesus. Jesus is the future. Jesus will be cut off and put to death and have nothing. But in the end, he will have victory as the desolator is destroyed. This was the response from heaven to Daniel's prayer. Daniel, my people, your people will suffer but will overcome in the end, and I believe the question for us today in 2024 is, are we ready? Are we ready? Is your soul prepared for that end? Are you prepared for that suffering, that trial that is to come? Jesus is still our future, and each of us will meet him one day. We find this out from the scriptures. We don't find this out from going to the world and asking them what's going to happen in the future. The scriptures tell us. The scriptures teach us. And if you aren't ready for Jesus, we encourage you to get ready. Get ready. Say the same as God. Confess your sin and turn from it. Be baptized and experience the joy of of a new life. God's promises still stand today. Let's let the promise of Scripture reorder our hearts and our lives. Let's learn to humble ourselves as we pray and petition God based on his goodness. And as we do, church, there will be a swift response from heaven, showing us our certain future with him and with his son Jesus Christ. Amen.